Okay. All right. So uh, one of the most important things to remember when you write an essay for me is that your, each paragraph should have an introduction, meaning an introductory statement about what you're about to talk about in the sense of the main issues, and textual support in the middle, and then conclude. That's just a basic for every paragraph, every written thing. Now, textual support means that you have to understand the text. I'm not asking, you're not going to have your textbook in front of you, so you can't and don't try to remember word for word things. You need to be able to, to come up with the ideas that show me that you know what the reading is about. Okay, I'm not asking for a word for word memorization of text. I'm asking you for summary, understanding, articulating the ideas, okay? All right, so for the first essay, Equiano, compare and contrast to Rowlinson. So we're going to break these up in the first paragraph com com um, comparison, and then we're going to go and talk about the contrast. Excuse me. Okay, so um, the comparison for Equiano and... Um, Rowlinson, is that they're both uh, narratives of captivity. We know that Equiano is focusing on an African, then later European captivity experience. Rowlinson is speaking of her captivity experience when it comes down to her being captive, held captive by the Native Americans. But they both are talking about their experiences. Narratives are about the experience. It is a way for people to tell their own story versus it being told about them, like an, uh, a biography. It is a way for them to get their belief systems out. And we see that in each of the pieces. Equiano, his belief systems are, pr are present, and Rowlinson's belief systems are present. For Equiano, his belief systems are based in the strength of the family. For Equiano, his belief systems are about the strength of the family. For him, he speaks of his experience as a young slave, meaning when he first was held captive, and being with Africans, and um, his um, experience with the uh, Europeans. He wants to think about the differences and how he felt about those experiences. For Rowlinson, her narrative and her captivity, she was kept, held captive by the Native Americans and her belief systems were based in her Puritan Christianity. So for Equiano, belief systems, strength of the family, and how slavery dissolved and was a detriment to family. For Rowlinson, it was her Puritan Christianity beliefs. And in her case, she focused on how she was able to um, integrate and help, hopefully help the Native Americans into Christianity. Yes, I'm, I'll, I'll repeat it many times. I may not say it exactly the same way, that's why you have to listen and you know, get the idea. So for Equiano, his belief systems were the strength of the family and how slavery was a detriment to that. It didn't matter if it was the African version or the European version, but certainly with the African version, he felt a similarity in his culture so even if he was a slave and was taken away from his primary family, he felt connection to the other family because he was the same. When he went to the European version of his slave experience, he didn't feel as connected to culture, so it was very much um, a very hot experience of his family being taken away from him. He didn't feel it as much when he was in the African experience because he was in the same culture but when he went to the uh, European experience, it was completely different. Remember Equiano speaking of that last comment where he questions those who are Christian? Remember? To say, you know, do you say, uh, do unto others as do unto me? Or you know what the golden rule is, right? Um, and he questions them and says, well, you know, if you believe this, how can you do this to me? Right? So his narrative was really about getting out that perspective. The contradiction 
of the Europeans in particular, but the contradiction of slavery and how it was against the family. Back to Rawlinson, Thomas. Rawlinson's Puritan Christian beliefs were throughout. She felt that she was assisting the Native Americans into Christianity. That was her belief system. She felt she was better than the Native Americans. Okay. The strong comparison between the two also is that they both felt some conflict. And write that down and I'll explain it a little better. The comparison of the two is that they both felt conflict in their captivity. For Equiano, the conflict in his, his um, captivity is that, particularly in the African experience, that he was a slave, but he was like, okay, well, I feel like one of the family. You know, I'm a slave, but they treat me like I'm one of the family. I have this, I'm able to sit in the house, and so that he was conflicted because, of course, he's a slave, but at the same time, he feels kinship. For Rowlinson, she had the same kind of comparison in that sense, that she was also conflicted. You know, she saw them as savages, non-Christian, you know, unsaved, but she felt their kindness as well. All right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> some of the literary devices, because you will have to do literary devices, obviously. Um, for for um, Equiano, he used the, the literary uh, device or technique of persuasion. By telling his experience from emotion, he persuades you to feel his pain. The stories of being taken away from his sister repeatedly let you know, right? So persuasion is key for him. That's literary device or technique. Literary device or technique for Rawlinson is illusion. An illusion meaning that it is a reference to a historical event, a religion, something in the past that you place in your future conversation as context. So she utilizes illusion when she talks about Job, Genesis, Deuteronomy, when she does all those biblical references, she's doing an illusion. She's using the literary device of illusion. Let you catch up. Questions? Clarification points? Comparing. You're still in comparison. You're still in comparison. I'm still in comparison. You should see that, you know, because we're talking about they use certain literary devices, but they also, one, like I said, Equiano and Rowlinson are both talking about their experience. They both conflicted. Right? Yeah. The belief systems? Well, for, for Equiano, the belief system is about the strength of the family. And he sees religion, I mean, he sees slavery as a uh, detriment to the belief system that he has very strongly. His, his piece is written with the belief system under, underneath all that that basically says the family is important, slavery takes that away. And he examples it both in African experience and even more extreme in the European experience. Hand here. So how is it like comparison between the literary devices? No, I'm just saying they both use literary devices. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. And let me let me just say that so what I can record that. So the question was, how do they? How does that? How is the literary device seen as a comparison? And the literary di device's comparison is to show that they both use them. That's the comparison part. Yes. Okay. So when you said the belief system, and you said the strength of the family, but then you said his experience of the United States and his experience with the Europeans. So how is that? Is he relating strength of the family to each of those? Is that what you're saying? Yes, let me explain it better. Or again, right? Okay, so Equiano is talking about the strength of the family. That's his belief system and how he certainly believes that slavery takes away that. Okay? He had two different experiences, one as an African slave and one as a European slave. He understood that as an African slave, family are still torn apart because his sister was constantly taken away from him and so that was very uh, clear. Right, Mackenzie? Okay. Then he had a secondary 
experience with the European slave owners, slavers, that was so brutal that whatever he felt, well, I'm still with my African culture as a slave, and the family may not be my immediate family, but it's some sense of family, he absolutely was taken away from family when he was placed in the European because it was so brutal and people were just completely ripped apart. Okay? So his belief system is played out through that. And for Rawlinson, her belief system is uh, Puritan-based Christianity, and she plays that out in her, her piece discussing uh, the, uh, the image of the savages, um, how they are not Christian, how they're not saved, and the idea of who they are to her and how she feels better than them in many ways. Equiano could be said as saying that he seems like he thinks he's a little bit better in many spaces because he's allowed to be in the house when he's an African slave. The relationships are very similar. Each one has an experience where they are not brutalized as much as they could be until he goes to European. So there's lots of little ideas that you could choose to hang your hat on and discuss. But in general, the main focus of, com of the comparison is belief systems and the use of literary devices in the same way. So what are the contrasts between um, Equiano and Rawlinson? The contrasts play mainly in how they were treated. Yeah, I mean, when I say, when I'm giving you these pieces, I don't expect you to like take everything that I say and write every little piece and duplicate it, because that would be, that would be, I'm writing your test for you. When I look at your, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I know this, okay? And when I look at your test, if you're not expressing yourself, I don't want to hear myself. I'm giving you information that helps you think. But you're not supposed to just spit this back out, and if you do, then I certainly know you are, because I have the tape, too, and I know what I'm saying. So I'm giving you ideas for you to decide which way you want to discuss it. You don't have to discuss all of those, but what one, the ones that you choose to discuss, you should choose to discuss them articulately, right? So in the contrast part of Equiano and Rowlinson, it goes into the idea of how they were treated. So we want to think about uh, Equiano's most uh, salient, meaning most important, slave experiences when he became a European slave. Okay, So when he was a European slave, he was brutalized and he was terrorized. And we go into our critical race theory when we think about this part of contrast. How was Rowlinson treated? She was treated fairly well. They tried to feed her, not tried to force her to feed her because, like Equiano, they wanted to force them to feed them so that they would not lose their property, right? But for her... They wanted to feed her because they didn't want her to starve to death. They were trying to be kind to her. So we're focusing on Equiano's European experience in the contrast and Rowlinson's captivity and how they were treated. And we're using critical race theory to think about how they were treated based upon their race. Okay, Because she was a white woman, we can assume, and we can make an inference based on the time, that her treatment and the Native Americans' general belief system itself of being kind, they treated her differently than the Europeans treated Equiano. And we can have examples, meaning textual support, based upon how the, she was fed, how he was fed. To survive, to be kind versus keep you as a piece of property to keep you alive so we can sell you. How she was treated to be able to go freely and go search for her son and go meet her son and then you got to be back at a certain time kind of thing. That was not Equiano's experience. So she had a lot of space to move freely in the midst of being held captive. Equiano in the European slave enslavement did not. And so clearly what I'm saying to you is if you're talking about contrast you want to kind of think about race theory meaning why was there difference in their experience based upon their race? And providing examples of that. 
and I'm again I'm not saying literal examples from the text summarizing the experiences that they had you reading it you reviewing it and going okay this was different this was different this was different finding those yourself okay questions about Equiano and Rowlinson comparison and contrast yes It's focused on that. It's focused on using critical race theory. How were they treated differently based upon their race? What were some of the things that really showed the European slavers and the Native Americans? Okay, yeah. Um, so you're saying that it's more about their race than their captors? Yeah. Good question. So, Swivel, she's saying it's more about their captors, right? Is that what you said? That was the question? Okay. So let's, let's tease it out a little bit more. Okay, when we think about critical race theory, you think about where someone stands in their culture and the things that they believe in. Okay? So the Europeans looked at the African slaves as property, less than human, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Native Americans, they were holding her captive so they could actually trade for food. So it wasn't, that, it wasn't a, 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 a equal kind of relationship in how they saw each other. But then again, I want you to think about the Native Americans had a belief system of respect for all. So even though they held her captive, they didn't want to harm her, right? They wanted to use her as a means to, for their own survival, right? But the Europeans were using the Africans because of their cultural norms in their mind of how blacks and Africans were seen as less than human and animals and property, all right? So you can tease and play around with that. But again, you want to provide yourself with support for that. Asia and Chad, make sure you're present. Make sure you're present. Okay. Questions? Yes. Yes. Now, when I say textual evidence, let me say it again. When I say textual evidence, I don't mean literal. I don't want you to try to remember that on page one oh so so. I want you to tell me the story. I want you to tell me the supportive information that you know because you've read it and demonstrate that. Yeah. So we don't really have like the citing. No citing because you won't. Ha you, I mean, I'm assuming that you're not going to be able to remember everything from that text, but you remember the stories and you remember the situations. So you're not going to be able to refer back to something because you're not going to come into class with your textbook. You're not going to be able to use your textbook. You're not going to be able to use anything that you bring. It's all blank page starting. So you have to work on it in your head, understand it, and discuss it in your head so that you're comfortable with discussing it on Monday. Okay? Yeah? Question? What about, like, phrases or quotes that are, you know, if you, yeah, I mean, like, give me liberty or give me death, things like that. If there is something that is comfortable for you, it doesn't matter how much. If you can remember something, then certainly use it but I'm not requiring you to use literal text. I'm asking you to make sure that you demonstrate that you know what the text is stating, stating the literary devices used, the belief systems, what you got from the reading in that way. Okay? All right? So like I said, you know, you don't have to say, um, for instance, you know, you can talk about Equiano's views on, on the family and slaves and be able to talk about that without having a quote like that last quote that he said. Even though you may not be able to quote that word for word, you could say and talk about that last one where he questions how you could be Christian. That will tell me that you know the text, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you know it li literally. And I don't need you to know it literally. I just need to know you know it. Okay? Any other on this before we go to the next one? All right, we're going to, uh, the next one is, here follows some verses, Bradstreet and World and Hound in me. Set yourself up. So Bradstreet and Dela Cruz. So this is the, uh, here follows some verses about the burning down of the house and comparing contrast to World and Hounding me. Yeah. Sister Dela Cruz. D-E-L-A-C-R-U-Z. Let me know when you're ready. With the 
Uh, this is this is uh, Bradstreet and Bradstreet and Dela Cruz, which is uh, the house burning down, and comparison to World and Hounding Me. Ready? Okay. So just know this is in, in my head and stuff, but it's not. You know, I'm I'm trying to trying to do this for you too. <laughs> so exhale. That's why I have the fan on because when I think this hard, I get my, my head gets hot. <laughs> I'm on I'm on a my brain is like overtime here. All right, yours are, yours are too, right? All right. Um, so Brad Street. All right. So Brad Street takes us on a journey from her belief system, which is Christianity, okay, Puritan based Christianity, the idea of the end of it being salvation. You have things here, you, you are born into this world, and you take a journey to become um, the end of your life, which is salvation to go to heaven. So she truly puts that belief system in her work. All right? And so what she does is she takes us on a journey between her house catching on fire and her um, um, being upset about these things, the material, we know we talked about that. You, you don't have to put all that down, but it's the journey of her acceptance finally that her religious faith will be the thing that sustains her, not the material. Okay? So the comparison is that for both, they're talking about the value of materials, the value of the material world. They both are. For Bradstreet, she has her material view based in her Christianity and her Puritan life. She is upset when it happens. She asks God to you know, take care of her and not let it happen. But once it happens, she does the memories of it. And then she goes into the space of, okay, I shouldn't be upset about this because it's all God's will. And then finally accepting it. But it's still about the value of material. Dela Cruz in World and Hound in Me is also focused on the material. What is the value of material things? They both are talking about the value of material things. Yes? What are the values, the belief system for Dela Cruz? Okay, I'm going to get to them. I hadn't, I hadn't said anything yet. Okay. What was that? Oh, I was just saying that for both of them, the comparison is that they both are questioning the value of material things. So Bradstreet is talking about material things in the, in the view of religion, right? Dela Cruz, on the other, the other end, this is still part of the comparison. We're still talking about how she sees material things. We know how she sees material things. Material things for her are not important. It's the, bond, it's the spiritual connection within who she is as an individual, the value of her mind as a material thing. Okay? So the comparison is based in how they see, they both see some value to the material, but they see it in different ways, and I'll get to that in a minute in the comparison. I mean, the, the contrast. But the comparison is that they both are having a conversation about the value of material things. Everybody needs to hear that. The comparison is they both are having a conversation about the value of material things. Rollinson's view, I mean, Bradstreet's view is based upon her belief system, which is Puritan, Christian, ideology. ideology. Uh, Dela Cruz is talking about um, material things based upon what we know about her, not just from the actual reading, but from what we know about her and the fact that she was a very intellectual person. She went into a convent and became a nun. She went into a convent and became a nun, and in during that time, she became very reflective and very introspective inside, and that helped develop her view. So while Bradstreet's views were developed by her being a Puritan Christian, um, Dela Cruz's views were shaped by her religious experience as well. So they both had religious experiences. You hear me? They both have religious experiences that shape their view on the material. Yes? Bradstreet was a Puritan. Dela Cruz was a former nun. 
Okay, so their views on materials and the material world were shaped on their religious views, yes. So are you saying that going through the value of the mind is a material thing, or was she buying the mind? She saw it as a, as a value, yes. So the value of something is her mind and her internal spirit. Okay, so so yeah. are you saying that she valued that over stuff that's material? Yes, she valued the mind and the body and the spirit more so than the material of, you know, the treasures. Remember line 7 and 8? The difference in how she talked about the word treasure? One is about the mind, one is about the things that you win or you achieve and gain. <clears throat> so again, the comparison is they're both talking about the value of material, but they also both come to that understanding based on their belief system, which is based on their religion. Literary devices. Anne Bradstreet, she writes in plain style. Right? Literary device technique. Yes. Anne Bradstreet, literary device or technique, she writes in plain style, which is for the common person. I don't want you to spend too much time talking about that, but you know, you know what it is. You don't have to go into a discussion of European and so on and so forth, but just explain what plain style is if you utilize that. In addition, um, Dela Cruz wrote this particular piece in the form of a sonnet, right? Okay. So their literary devices, plain style, liter literary device techniques, plain style and sonnet. Yes, Keith. We're not in contrast yet. I'm just talking about who they are. We're still in comparison. Okay. All right. Any any questions on the comparison side? The thoughts that you have? I mean, I'm giving you ideas that you can talk about. Certainly, like I said, I'm not asking you to regurgitate, but I'm giving you really clear ideas so you can articulate and, and show me your own flow, right? Okay. So the contrast for other two, um, <clears throat> the contrast for um, Rowland, I mean Bradstreet and um, Dela Cruz would clearly be that one sees her material provided by God and therefore it's okay to lose it because she really still focuses on the material. So for Rawlinson, the end of the day, Bradstreet for the end of the day is that her possessions are gone but they were given to her by God. For Dela Cruz, the material mind is not the same as God's gift of material things. It's something that she achieves by being thoughtful, introspective, and thinking. It's not something that she can go out and buy. You know what I'm saying? So God, God can give you these possessions. You can go and wind up making those or buying those, et cetera, et cetera. But it's totally different than being able to have something inside of you. So the comparison, again, was that they both were religious-based and how they got there. But what material things mean to them is very much different. It's very much a contrast to that. Okay. Okay. So Dela Cruz has a very clear view of what material is. It is not about the treasures of owning things. Dela Cruz is, is about the treasure of the mind. Um, Bradstreet, on the other hand, accepts that there are material items that have value, but she just doesn't put them over God. All right? And so if you see in... in um, Dela Cruz, when she says world and hounding me, she doesn't accept this idea of having material things in such a way. While Rawlings, I mean Bradstreet, does have material things, she accepts it as I got it, I got it through God, but you know, ultimately God giveth and God taketh away. But she does accept their existence, that she does like to have those things. Those things are important to her, they're just not more important than God. For Dela Cruz, this kind of internal conversation that she has with herself. She refuses to, to connect herself to this idea that material things are good. She tells the world, you're wrong. What I'm feeling, my mind, and having material treasure in that way is the best way. So you can imagine Bradstreet having a conversation and say, it's okay to have things. Just don't get too attached to them because God will take them away if you become too attached to them. Or the idea that you're giving to them, you're giving them by God. Dela Cruz is not about the material at all. 
she doesn't accept that we need these things. You need to focus on this. This here. I'm probably going to make a lot of noise on that microphone. Okay. So we have the comparison and contrast for that. Any questions? Yeah. Contrast, okay. It's how they see the material. So for Bradstreet, it's okay to have material things. Just don't get too caught up in them because they're provided by God, so therefore they could be taken away from God, taken away by God. For Dela Cruz, it's not even okay to really focus on material things because the most important material thing is the material in your mind, what cannot be taken away from you. You know what they say, that you know this is one thing, when you learn something, it can't be taken away from you. Well, Bradstreet wouldn't agree with that because everything can be taken away from you because God will do so. But for Dela Cruz, it's the thing that cannot be moved, that cannot be taken away from her because it is within her spirit. Yes? Um, so you said in the first um, two pastors that uh, lit devi literary devices that are used are... Plain style? Are completely yeah. part of the comparison? Yeah, I always say the literary devices, unless there's something dramatic about it. The literary devices should be... Everybody hear that? The literary devices should be discussed in the comparison because they use them. Okay? Some people don't, you know, it's not really clear. And I'm, you know, when I'm saying about their literary devices, I won't even discuss them. So some people will say they don't use them. I'll, obviously, everyone does. But the comparison is that they, they all use literary devices. So you always want to discuss that there as a description of who they are in the comparison side. Any other questions about? Brad Street and Dela Cruz. That's the only um, contract we have. No, that's the one I tell you you can work on. Yeah. Again, no regurgitation. You can come up with a lot of thoughts and process about this conversation from that. Okay. Yes. Um, I still understand answer to Mom's question because, like, it's two different styles. It, but but okay. Look at look. Listen to exact what I'm words I'm saying. Yes, they're two different styles, but they both use literary devices. So I want you to put them in the comparison side because they both u utilize them. Okay. So that's something they share. They both use literary devices. Okay. All right. Can I move on? Okay. Uh, Sinners in the hands of an angry God. The speech to the Virginia Convention. Jonathan Edwards, Patrick Henry. Set yourself up. Yes. Um, speech to the Virginia Convention. Patrick Henry. Are you ready? Hmm? Um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and the uh, speech to the Virginia Convention, which is Patrick Henry. Jonathan Edwards? Yeah. Samara? Okay. Maybe I'll just, the last class, I'll just show them the video and not talk the whole time. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> you too? I know. You going to go through all of them? Yes. Yeah. 12.20? Right? You got 20 minutes. I, I'm, I got plenty of time. All right, okay. I am going to post the video, but you need to demonstrate your own stuff by doing that. So, you know, you'll fill in the blanks. These are all, what I say, your success, success packet. My daughter used to come, come home from school so happy whenever somebody gave her a packet at school. I got a packet. I got a, you know, she was one of those, like, really super nerds. We got a packet to study. I'm like that, too. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and um, Speech to the Virginia Convention. The Comparison. 
They both are extremely impassioned pleas. They're impassioned pleas. So they're very passionate about what they're trying to get you to do. They're, they're begging. They're imploring you. They're trying to get you to do something. They both are very much. So that means if you use the word impassioned please, I'm going to know you use my word because you didn't know what it was. No. So they're very much about getting, I know you know that. I know you know it. I'm joking with you. So, no, no, don't, don't, don't even go there. I'm, I'm, let me get back on track. I was making my little private joke. All right. So they both give very much impassioned pleas about what they want you to do. All right. For Jonathan Edwards, obviously he wants people to come back to the church. The ungenerate, unregenerate, right? Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. He's making an impassioned plea to get everybody back into the church. Patrick Henry is making an impassioned, impassioned plea about the militia and, and what is important for them to join together to um, protect the new United States. Can you reword that? Uh, I can, yeah, I can reword it. I can try to reword it again. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so both are very passionate about what they believe in. And both are very passionate about the language they use to get people to do what they want them to do. What they want them to do, Jonathan Edwards and Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, he wants people to come back to the church. Patrick Henry, what he wants them to do is to form a militia to protect the U.S. So in the comparison side, they both are making pleas. They both are making speeches. One is a sermon, of course, and the other is a speech. But they both are pleas to get people to respond and to act. Right? Yes? M-I-L-I-T-I-A-I-A, -I, -I, I believe. Militia, I'm in my brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T-I-A. M I L I, it's like Mississippi. It's one of those, like, all those little, yeah. M I L I T I A. Okay. So they both are making pleas to get people to do something. Edwards, it's a sermon to get people to come to the church. Patrick Henry, a speech to the Virginia Convention, a speech for a new militia to save the uh, the new United States. Um. They both are using uh, persuasive language when it comes down to their liter liter literature devices and terms. We know that there is a great use of metaphor in uh, Jonathan Edwards. One of the main metaphors, if you recall, is the uh, spider's web and the rock going through the spider's web. He uses lots of imagery in the sense that he speaks of great floods. Um, actions of of hell he even um you know you don't have to so much remember this if you wanted to i mean this is one of those things that's kind of extra i didn't ask you to remember it but he also um um talks about hell in a way that makes it human All right so he uses a lot of imagery a lot of metaphor and so does patrick henry in his speech very dramatic we know that he's very dramatic in his words, as well as um, Patrick, uh, as well as Jonathan Edwards. Give me liberty or give me death at the end. Dramatic imagery. Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, and we're still in the comparison in how he uses his language to do this. He talks often about uh, slavery. If we don't do this, we'll be enslaved. Um, Jonathan Edwards talks about if you don't do this, then God's hands will open up and you will be put into the pit of hell. They use fear. Enslaved for Patrick Henry. Jonathan Edwards, you'll fall into hell. All of it acting on people's deepest fears. Deepest fears in the sense that for Jonathan Edwards' audience, listen carefully, for Jonathan Edwards' audience, their deepest fears because they were dealing with Christian revival and, and Puritanism, their deepest fear was to go to hell, right? For Patrick Henry's group, their deepest hell was to not be free because they were coming from an environment where they felt like that they were not free, but they could also still see slaves around them. 
Okay. All right. So acting and using imagery and words to make people respond to their deepest, darkest fears, they both had in that in common. Um, <clears throat> the contrast. Are you on my hmm? I have a question. Oh, a question on comparison? Yeah. Um, on like Patrick Henry um, using like the persuasive um, language. Mm -hmm. Patrick Henry uses persuasive in, in, um, language. Um, one of the things that, this is in the comparison part, one of the things that Jonathan Edwards does by his, you know, talking, he gives the experience. Everyone knows he's a pastor. He has the experience. He puts it out there that I've done this, I've seen this, I've experienced this. Patrick Henry does as well. Remember we talked about the persuasive language and the figurative language when he says, uh, you know, I have shown the lamp on it. I have, you know, my experience is so-and-so. I've seen this. He gives you that space to know that he has the experience. That's persuasive uh, persuasive language. Logic meaning that he knows what he's talking about, the emotion that you'll go to hell. Persuasive meaning not hell, but slavery, I'm sorry. That you'll go, you'll become enslaved if you don't do this. If you don't do what I'm asking you to do by forming a militia, you have the risk of going, uh, becoming enslaved. Does that answer you? Yes. Any other questions about that? Okay. The main um, thing to think about with the contrast, of course, is that one is a religious piece, and one is what? A political, a political speech. One is given in the, in the pulpit, one is given in a space of political arena. Different settings. One in the sermon, in a, in a pulpit, one in a, a speech in a political setting. So, again, the contrast can be played out in ways of thinking about these different settings and what uh, the belief systems of the people who are in front of him have to do with it. One, of course, being a religion, then they are focused more on, like I said, their deepest fear, but also um, the language has to be important to think about, uh, again, our critical theory when we think about who, are the, who is the audience. Who is the audience? Is it... Religion-based? Is it Christian-based, Puritan, or is it so certain social class? Are they mentioning women? Are women present? Those kinds of things, the contrast between the two. Right. So Jonathan Edwards, in contrast, is mentioning everybody's going to hell, right? It doesn't matter if you're man or woman. Patrick Henry is imploring men to act. See what I'm saying? Everybody's going to hell, this contrast. Everybody's going to hell versus I'm asking men to just stand up and do what they need to do. You got it written down, Derek? Asia? Chad? Okay. Any questions? Can I rephrase what? Any questions? <laughs> what, what are we talking about? You need to be specific so I can answer the question. Uh, the difference is in how the belief systems play out and how our critical theory makes us look at who is the audience. So if you're in a, in a, in a sermon, if you're in a church giving a sermon versus in a political arena, the audience in the sermon is, for him, it is everyone's going to hell. It's not, it's not, you don't even have to know whether or not they're talking about men and women. You know that he's talking about everybody. But in this particular space, in the political arena, you know in his phrasing, because he says certain words that are gender-based, that he's talking to men. That's the contrast. Okay? Yeah. That's uh, the one you can focus on and move around on, talk about. Um, next, the Declaration of Independence, compare and contrast to Iroquois and Seneca Falls. And Seneca Falls is one that we did not uh, cover, so I'm going to stand up and I'm going to go over a couple of notes here. 
I heard, I have a question, yeah. Shh. We're doing Declaration of Independence. Mm, sorry, spitting. Declaration of Independence and uh, Iroquois Constitution as well as Seneca. So Iroquois and Seneca versus Independence, Declaration of Independence, yeah. Can we, like, add some of our own ideas? Absolutely. I expect you to. I expect you to study. I don't expect you to give me my word for word back. I want you to show me your work as well, your ideas. I'm giving you ideas, but, you know, you don't have to do exactly as I do. I don't want you to exactly. I want you to be able to articulate it in ways that make sense. There, look up here, Asia. Look at my hand. I said, look at my hand. Independence, Declaration of Independence, and two pieces. So one and two. One compared to two. Okay. Independence compared to Iroquois and Seneca Falls. Okay? Iroquois is I R O Q U O I S. Q U O I S, I'm sorry. Q U O I S, I missed it. Okay. Comparison. All, all those documents are, um, hmm? Okay. We got time. Seneca Falls. Seneca Falls. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, so um, all three pieces, even though we're comparing two against one, all three pieces in comparison are uh, political documents. They are all asking a particular group to understand, you know, who they are as a group, what has happened to this particular group, and where you're moving forward to. They all have some kind of structure of formulating order, so the, repeat for that. They all are um, political documents that are taking a group from one, you know, place of order to tell people what who they are, what their uh, what has been happening to them, and what direction they're going in order to uh, create a better place for them. Okay. Who they are. What's happened to them and where they're heading is the best way to think about it. Each document. So in comparison, each document is about who they are, what's happened to them, and where they're heading. Each of these documents have some form of order into, into it that makes it a political document that will live a long time, meaning this is the structure for your society. This is a structure for your understanding of what to do and what to be in this world. Okay? The Declaration of Independence, Iroquois Constitution, and Seneca Falls. Okay? Um, <clears throat> literary devices, they both, they all three use them. So, in um, the Declaration of Independence parallelism, and please don't ask me to spell that because I can but it's another one of those L L L L. Morgan does it really well. You did it with the rhythm yesterday. So it. P A R A L L E L I S M. There you go. Parallelism. I can spell it. Just don't like to. All right. So they both use parallelism, meaning uh, Seneca Falls and the Declaration of Independence both use parallelism. Parallelism. Not the Iroquois. That's what you should know. Did everybody hear me? Declaration of Independence and Seneca Falls both use parallelism. So in um, the Declaration of Independence, parallelism is using that same repeated term with an action word. He, let me go. He has dissolved. He has called together. He has forbidden. Okay. And in Seneca Falls, which you may take note, Seneca Falls is on page 110. He has never permitted. He has withheld. He has made. He has made. He has framed. Okay? They both use parallelism to drive home what has happened 
to them. Okay, yes. This is in the comparison part, yes. They both use parallelism, a, a, an action word along with some, the same phrasing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's fine, because Iroquois doesn't use it. So, but they use it as a means to drive home what has happened to them. That's the comparison as well. Yes? You said using the action word with the what? With the phrase, the same phrase. He has done this, he has done this, he has done this, he has done this. The Iroquois, they use uh, figurative language and dramatic language. As you remember, talking about peace. For instance, uh, the um, it's almost it's almost parallelism, but it's not. It's just repetitive um, phrasing that we cast all weapons of war. We cast all weapons of strife. They use dramatic imagery to discuss their view, vision of peace in their world. But again, the comparison is that all three are trying to use their political document as a means to say who they are, uh, what's happened to them, and where they're heading in structure and order for their culture. We're doing fine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, The, um, com the contrast, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, because they're, they're speeches, and they, like I said, if you can just focus on that and give me the data and stuff like that, you can go shape. The com that's why I said we're going to be able to finish, because the last two are shorter in the sense of how much there's information to do, because they are short pieces. Okay, so the contrast is related to um, who they're talking to, okay? So, in the first case, and listen very carefully, in the Declaration of Independence, the he that is being spoken of is the Britons or the British king, right? So, in, 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 in one way, shape, or form, it is a society that they're running from or they're trying to leave. So the he that they're saying in parallelism, he has done this, he has done that. It's the British king, the Britons. Okay? Uh, almost an ideology of society, that they are no longer there. In um, the Seneca Falls piece, listen very carefully. In Seneca Falls, the, the author says, the history of mankind is a history that you can just... Just listen very carefully. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So the he in this is men. Okay. So while the, com the, con the contrast of this is that for the Declaration of Independence, the he was the body of Britain. British king. In this one, Seneca, the he is men, specifically. Yeah. Did they say like what type of men? Like, they're just talking about men. They said men are bad. That's what they're saying. <laughs> this was on page 110 and 111. Page 110 and 111. Okay. And for the Iroquois, they don't use parallelism, but truly who they're speaking to is a space of we need to be peaceful, right? So it is how we're going to treat the earth, okay? How are we going to work together to have a better earth? So they're talking to other native tribes? Yeah, they're talking to other native tribes. How are we going to work together to make a, a better earth? So you have the British, the society of the British. You have men, and you have the world, right? That's the, con that's the contrast of how they're speaking. I didn't hear you. What was it? Yeah, the Iroquois is talking to the, to the world. They're, they're asking each other to work together to make a better world. All right? this, is what we, this is who we are, this is what's happened to us, and this is where we're heading in a better world. They're not excluding anyone. They want people to come, but they're not really caring if you do or not because their idea is that this is the world. They're not distinguishing amongst people because we're all 
part of it. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Any other points, questions about Declaration of Independence, Seneca Falls, and the Iroquois Constitution? We're not done yet. So just hang with me. We still have seven minutes. And we, ha we have Benjamin Franklin and, um, yeah, Benjamin Franklin and Native American literature. This is the one that is not quite obvious of how they compare and contrast. At least I don't think it is. Yes, Benjamin Franklin and Native American literature. So listen very carefully. <clears throat> How are they comparing? Well, they both are essentially creation myths. The Native American literature and the Benjamin Franklin autobiography. And the reason why I say that, listen very clearly, they're both creation myths. That's the comparison. They're both creation myths because what did I say about Benjamin Franklin? He is and he provides the quintessential, unquestioned masterpiece of the age of realism, right? So people used his words to create cultural norms. So he created our base of culture. In the same way that when you read the literature from Native Americans, they are telling us how to be moral and respectful of the earth. Benjamin Franklin is telling his story. He's, it's what sometimes we call a biomyth, which is a biography that's mythical in the sense you're not really sure if it's true or not. He's telling you how he was as a teenager and some of the journeys he had, and he's telling you these 13 virtues of how to be moral and all this other stuff. He's telling us how to behave and how to be perfect, perfection, how to reach perfection. The creation myths and, and cowdy and all that good stuff, the Native American literature is doing the same thing. It's putting out a path for how to be what I call a good earthling, a good citizen of the earth. Right? Those Native American stories were all about how do you become, how do you understand how we got here, and how do you become a person who respects what's here? Yeah. How did the story? How did that? Because it talks about how Native American literature is in place and how it was told from story to story and how people learned to respect it and have these traditions, particularly the ones that we're talking about where they go and they do the sun. Uh, ceremonies and how they continue to do that over time because they respect the original stories, right? Okay. So again, Benjamin Franklin, in comparison to the other the Native American stories, is related to they're both creation myths and they both set up an understanding of how a culture is supposed to be established. One about the Native Americans and how to be a good earthling, and the other is how to be a good United States citizen, how to be moral and have particular characteristics that we still see today and respect today. Was that a hand? Okay. Yeah. You said both set up how culture should be established? Or not? Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> All right. Yes. The creation myths or the Native American literature always tells you how to establish yourself as a citizen of the earth and how to respect it and how to move forward. Um, Benjamin Franklin's creation myth, his autobiography, sets us up to understand how to be a good American citizen. All right? Okay? The contrast in those two is related to the idea, and please follow carefully, that Benjamin Franklin is asking us to really think about who we are as individuals. How do you become a good person individually? How do you, uh, you know, fit into the U.S. society, have good morals, et cetera, et cetera? And again, those, those, um, those 13 um, ideas of how to become a moral person. It's rugged individualism, if you've ever heard of that term. That's what the United States is founded on. The idea as an individual, you can go out there and you can decide, this is who I'm going to be, and I can do this. And, you know, if you don't do this, then that's fine. Everybody's on their own. We hope that we come together, but you know what? I'm on my own. I can do this. That rugged individualism, he was putting that into his space. The Native Americans have never been that way. It's always been about the world and the community. So while Benjamin Franklin was putting up an understanding of what it means to be an individual and a U.S. citizen, 
the Native Americans were putting up again what it means to be that way for the entire world. So they both were putting together what it means to be a good person. But one is more individualistic and U.S. centric and the other is more group, community, spirit, soul, respecting of the whole earth. And you can example that in, in both. You can see how uh, the, 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 even when Coyote, remember the Coyote finishes his work? When he becomes an individual and he starts to do his own thing, all kind of crap happens, right? It doesn't work, right? But when they work together, when they come back, then the earth is a better place. For Benjamin Franklin, being an individual is a good thing because you can work on your, yourself. You can help other people, but you're focused on what you are doing as an individual. We have one minute. Dang, I'm good. Any questions? Yes. What was that? Yes. It'll be on YouTube. But please don't just wait for me. Make sure you do your stuff. Okay. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna post it tonight. I'm not gonna post it tonight. I have to edit it. And make sure everything is on it. I know, it's just, it's just a matter of uploading it, I know. But most, okay, you want me to post it tonight? Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Sorry, great. Okay. I appreciate it. We'll see. All right, so remember, come in prepared. Follow the, the uh, notebook. Go through all the resources you have to prepare yourself. But more than anything else, pre-write. Pre-write. And make sure you're, it's in your head so when you come in, you're good to go. All right? Yes. No, you keep that for yourself. Keep that for yourself. All right. There it is. Have a good weekend.